The Hopi Native American tribes say that the earth is spotted like a fawn. Each spot represents a center of great power. Each of these is unique, having its own special function in sustaining the world and everything that lives in it. Last episode, we discussed the genesis and the foundations of sacred space. Now it's time to dive deeper. In this episode, we will explore the mysterious and incredible powers of sacred space, as well as the various ways in which these have and continue to be used by people around the world for the enhancement and elevation of human existence. Join me as we journey into the wilderness, from murky caverns where no light can reach, to secluded groves deep within the forest, to lofty mountain peaks reaching up toward the stars. In the most remote past, human beings discovered these numinous places and learned to channel their power in order to shape reality communicate with beings from beyond the veil, and even travel into other realms, using the power of the natural world to accomplish the most supernatural feats. Welcome to The Hidden Passage, a podcast where we explore all things supernatural, from ancient history to modern day. Sacred space was identified in the external landscape through an internal expression within human beings. In this way, it announced its presence. Looking at the historical records as well as modern studies recording effects on the brain and the psyche, it is clear that certain places have profound effects on consciousness. Geographer and author Carolyn Prorok writes, Extraordinary experiences binds people to objects and places, a process that is part and parcel of the progressive transformation of ordinary space into sacred space. When the biblical Jacob in his dream saw a vision of a ladder ascending to heaven by which the angels ascended and descended, he awoke in awe, exclaiming, How dreadful is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Concerning the sacred mounds in Celtic regions, the first branch of the Mabinogi, a 12th century Welsh manuscript, reads, The strange thing about the mound is that whatever nobleman sits on it will not leave there without one of two things happening. Either he will be wounded or injured, or else he will see something wonderful. The secondary way in which sacred space revealed itself was through augury, or the discovery and interpretation of signs and omens. To ancient people, these signs were either direct messages from the spiritual worlds, or manifestations of spirit itself and so augury was considered essential in guiding people to make correct decisions in many important aspects of life, from the level of individuals to whole communities. Since this hierophany, or physical manifestation of the sacred, constituted a break in what historian of religion Mircea Iliade referred to as the homogeneity of space, It could be perceived as an unusual feature in the landscape or behavior of local flora and fauna, 
really anything that deviated from the normal patterns of nature. This idea is not unlike the belief that natural-born shamans exhibited certain physiological aberrations. If these signs could not be observed, they could also be induced through the practice of divination. Various methodologies were developed to acquire and decode these supernatural ciphers, which could reveal sacred space. It was through this attunement to nature that space was negotiated and allocated between humans and the gods. The results of divination held sway over all human action. With regard to space specifically, it dictated migrations and the placement of settlements. An example of this can be found in hunter-gatherer cultures, whereby the spot on which a hunted animal would fall would be marked as sacred and a village would be founded there. The Greek Pliny the Elder wrote of his meeting with a Persian magi who determined the right action for a place by tossing stones onto the ground and reading their configuration. This he termed geomancy, a divination system involving some form of contact with the earth to determine the metaphysical quality of a location. Geomancy was used in much of the great architecture of the ancient world. In summary, Iliadi stresses this point, quote, men are not free to choose the sacred site they can only seek for it and find it by the help of mysterious signs. We find this idea in the book of Exodus, quote, It is no mortal who proclaimed a certain location as sacred, but the voice of God himself. And again, this idea is expressed in the Chinese book of wisdom, the I Ching, quote, Heaven and earth determine the places. The holy sages fulfill the possibilities of the places. Through the thoughts of men and the thoughts of spirits, the people are enabled to participate. The ancients recognized a wide variety of innate spiritual powers of the land, which varied depending on the location. Their influence on human beings was espoused by many of the Greek philosophers. Hippocrates, known as the father of medicine, acknowledged that some places had therapeutic effects while others were deleterious. Plato, while accepting the existence of mundane environmental influences like climate and soil, nonetheless maintained that the supernatural forces residing in the land were likely the most impactful. One of the primary powers of sacred space made use of by human beings was its ability to invoke mystical experiences. A classic example of this is the renowned Cave of Delphi on the slopes of Mount Parnassus, in which the oracle Pythia would receive messages from the god Apollo. Mount Sinai was not only the location where Moses was given the Ten Commandments, but also where the prophet Muhammad had his revelation, and Saint Catherine her visions. In the Bible, we are told that Jesus would frequent wilderness locations for prayer, evidently to strengthen his spiritual connection and possibly to even draw some kind of power from it. A passage from Matthew 17 reads, After six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, 
and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. In ancient Egypt, as well as Greece, sacred sites were used in the practice of dream incubation, whereby a person would sleep on the ground to receive divine messages through dreams. Sometimes this prophetic quality was oriented towards therapeutic and healing purposes. One Egyptian woman who had been suffering from infertility slept at a sacred site and in her dream was approached by the god Imhotep, who instructed her to brew a tea from the leaves of a certain plant for her husband. She did so and afterwards was able to conceive. Try this. <laughs> we can perhaps glean the most nuanced interpretation of sacred space within the Native American traditions as they place such a high emphasis on living in communion with nature. In native belief, sacred space, often known as power centers, are multifarious, each with their own unique energies, and each used for a specific purpose, of which there are many. For instance, certain sites are used for good luck, or aid in pursuing a certain profession. There are also power centers that are only used by women. The unifying factor in all types of sacred sites is a superabundance of energy, which distinguishes them from the surrounding areas. According to Native American healer and author Robert Lake Tom, also known as Medicine Grizzly Bear Lake, this energy can be positive, negative, or neutral. After interviewing Native tribes across America for over a decade, author James A. Swan compiled a list of sacred site categories. A condensed version of the list is as follows. Baptismal sites, fertility sites, burial grounds, purification sites, places of special flora, fauna, or minerals, vision questing locations, mytho-historical sites, places of healing and spiritual renewal, and astronomical observatories. Some of these are similar in terms of the essential quality of their power, but are separated by their ritual function. For instance, baptismal and purification sites would use the same principle of water, and both shamanic journey sites and burial grounds would use points of passage between the worlds. Moreover, all the various uses of sacred space have a common foundation. Swan writes, According to the Hopi and other Indian peoples, sacred space enables us to stay in closer touch with the various spiritual realms, which are the roots of healing, meaning, creativity, and the basis for personal power. So the particular way in which a space manifests seems to have a lot to do with the way in which it's used, how that raw potential is shaped and channeled. A good example of this is the historical sites, which are believed to be imprinted with certain energies based on the events that transpired there. Think back to our opening myth in part one, where the ancestors formed the land through their actions. This also connects to the concept of hauntings. So this paradigm really emphasizes that an intimate connection exists between humanity and the earth, the ways in which it is constantly influencing us and how we in turn influence it. As creatures of the earth, we are born into a sort of covenant comprised of the laws of nature. The native worldview contends that a balanced symbiotic relationship must be maintained in order for humans and the earth to thrive. This has become all the more relevant in the wake of modern industrial development. Of the Hopi shamanic tradition, author Thomas E. Mails wrote, 
individuals who have worked their way through various initiation ceremonies are in touch with these forces, conceived to be just as natural as are the more readily observed laws of the physical world. The models of healing emerging from these traditions are based on God's laws. An initiate can restore an ill person to health by performing these rituals, prescribing herbs and utilizing techniques that place the healee within the natural scheme of things. Techniques that restore an internal balance, reflecting the balance of the universe. It's no wonder then that the power of nature is invoked in shamanic healing because nature is itself an expression of balance and wholeness. Many Native American sacred sites are believed to contain the power to heal. A Karuk myth tells of a man whose children were abducted and devoured by an entity known in English as an upslope person. This is probably one of the many names for what we know today as Bigfoot. After finally killing the creature, he salvages the bones of his children and soaks them in the lake of power near the monster's lair, whereby they are restored to life. <sighs> A Karuk medicine man describes his healing ritual using the power of the land. Quote, A medicine man must go to the mountain or some other power center to pray for his people that is his job. I connect with the power and shoot it straight down from the mountaintop into the sacred dance. It is like a beam of light or electricity. It will make the healing more powerful. It strengthens the dancers. And I ask the spirits from the mountain to come down and dance with us in the ceremony, just as our ancestors originally did in the beginning. Power centers could be used in many other ways by magical practitioners, some of which seemed to defy all rationality. The knowledge of sacred space is due to their efforts, because they are the ones who actively seek them to aid in their work. With respect to this, Lake Tom explained, quote, Medicine men and women, shamans from other countries, and spiritual slash psychic healers, such as lamas and gurus, can make the right connection with a power center and cause lightning, thunder, rain, and even snow on a clear day or night. Anthropologist Doug Boyd, in his book Rolling Thunder, remarks on such abilities demonstrated by his eponymous informant, quote, I had seen several demonstrations of Rolling Thunder's handling of the weather. In addition to the rain that came on the way to Ruby Valley, at the abandoned ranch and in camp, we heard thunder several evenings when he was in camp and told us to listen for it. There was never any when he was not around. Added to the list of coincidences, if they were coincidences, was the fact that whatever it was, lightning, rain, or thunder, the intended phenomenon had always appeared at the intended time and place, and it was usually announced before it happened. What interested me was not whether, but how these things were being done. This kind of ability, which in the shamanic view consists of essentially tapping and redirecting the forces of the power center, was used for agriculture protection and power acquisition. This could be accomplished by obtaining a power object or animal through which the power center manifested and using this in rituals. Dreaming or soul journeying might also be used to gain the resident spirit as an ally. In more dramatic cases, a chase or conflict with the spirit would ensue, and upon being subdued, granted the shaman power in some form. So why do these interactions with sacred space yield such fruitful results? 
Consider the esoteric idea that we've previously explored, that the physical world is one of limitation, receiving only a fraction of the full power of the upper worlds, and this is restricted by something like the metaphysical equivalent of a governor on an engine. In succeeding in his mission, the journeyer is able to pull down some of this sequestered power into his Middle Earth, attaining an extraordinary prize which, in its place of origin, is actually ordinary. In modern language, we could call it hacking the programming, or breaking out of the matrix, or even modding a video game. But from the perspective of the programmer, it's just a few lines of code. Sacred space represents the conduit through which this can be achieved. I kind of think of it like the script extender. In some cases, it was even believed that gifted individuals could actually do something like reconfigure the energetic structure of the Earth itself. An Incan legend regarding the famed ruler Manco Capac states that he was able to shift a power center from Tibet all the way to the Peruvian Andes, somehow redirecting this stream of energy with a golden staff. Now that is some serious wizard stuff. Guys will hear that and just think, hell yeah. There are also a separate set of locations where pilgrimages are made to reciprocate power given through prayer and offering. Lake Tom stated, this kind of energy is needed to replenish her psychic centers. As a living organism, the Earth needs recharging because it can occasionally become drained. We see similar ritual purity and systems of reciprocation in Shinto, the indigenous ancient religion of Japan, which also emphasized harmony with nature. It seems if we go back far enough in time, we find religious traditions across the world share the same reverence for nature, suggesting that this may represent the natural, spiritual expression of human nature. The power of sacred sites seems to be immune to the displacement of cultures and their beliefs because, as we will later investigate, that power may come from the location itself rather than anything conferred upon it through mere imagination. Sacred space has to do with the shape and power intrinsic to the earth itself and is not based on some event that happened there, wrote the late religious studies professor Walter L. Brenneman Jr., the very configuration of the land makes the earth powerful. This is why certain remarkable geological features are considered sacred. Taking an inventory of sacred spaces across the world, these features are most often mountains, hills, caves, springs, and rivers. In looking at Native American traditions, we can expand this list to include rock outcroppings, waterfalls, forests, plateaus, and ocean sites. Historian Eleanor Gaddon, in her study of sacred sites in India, also supports the idea that, quote, the sacred object is the site itself. The power comes from the place, not so much any deity associated with it. To piggyback off this, consider that at Delphi, long before the arrival of the Apollonian Oracle, people would make pilgrimages there to sleep in the bosom of Gaia. Here is a solid testament to this axiom. Since we have two different groups of people contacting different gods through the same outlet. Here's another example. A Catholic church at Shimayo in New Mexico is built over a site where natives had come for healing long before it was built. Some of the floorboards were pulled up so that pilgrims could still take some of the sacred earth with them. Across Europe, 
Christian churches built over pagan sacred sites known for their supernatural potency invoked experiences with saints and angels, just as they had done before for the pagans with their respective gods and spirits. Even today among the secular, these places still inspire awe. So all of this amounts to perhaps some of the best evidence we have for a real outside phenomenon at work here. Of course, you could argue that these places are just cool, and well, people like cool places. They make us feel good, because they're aesthetically pleasing. But is this enough to account for everything we're covering here? I'll leave it here for now, but we'll come back to this later. So working off this idea of the intrinsic power of the land, we can say that all the great structures, the temples, the cairns, stone circles, and the like, were meant to mark, venerate, perhaps even harmonize with, or somehow amplify, the already existing energies. These locations were no doubt chosen carefully by their builders, as they're almost always in proximity to special geological features. Take Stonehenge, for instance. This structure is built on the exact point of convergence of three underground streams. The Hawaiian kahuna, or wise man, Momi Loon, opined, The land isn't sacred because the temple is here. The temple is here because the land is sacred. Lake Tom also agreed that, quote, a good work of architecture is really a ritual which honors the power of place. The Hopi tribe of southwestern Arizona put a strong emphasis on the power of shrines. Their villages were themselves considered to be shrines and were laid out in specific ways and ceremonialized in order to align with the earth energy and receive blessing. In this way, villages were planted into the ground, like a seed being sown. In his book, The Hopi Survival Kit, Thomas Mills wrote, All shrines grew deep in all directions, weaving their roots into the earth like fabric and thus maintaining the balance and harmony with all life. They are endowed with powers of self-protection, a weapon of mysterious power. Those who defy and disturb their roots without respect suffer great misfortune, which can extend to the whole of mankind. So here we can see a pretty overt conviction that structures can somehow interact with sacred space. Could this also have been a motivation of the megalith builders? And what did they actually accomplish by doing this? Not only did sacred space attract human beings, it was also favored by various gods, spirits, and other entities. Expounding on the effects of place on human beings, Plato wrote that, quote, Most markedly conspicuous of all will be the localities which are the homes of some supernatural influences, or the haunts of spirits who give a gracious or ungracious reception to successive bodies of settlers. Various entities were believed to inhabit all manner of sacred sites, if you come across a grove of old trees that have lifted up their crowns, wrote the Roman philosopher Seneca, up above the common height and shut out by the light of the sky, by the darkness of their interlacing boughs, you feel that there is a spirit in the place. So lofty is the wood, so lone the spot, so thick the unbroken shade. Among the Japanese, Mount Fuji was said to be the abode of the goddess Senjin, who in primordial times is purported to have, quote, 
hovered in a luminous cloud above the crater, tended by invisible servants who were prepared to throw down any pilgrims who were not pure of heart. Shinto placed a strong emphasis on spiritual beings which were thought to inhabit special places in nature. These numerous sites became cultic centers, which people would visit to honor and seek the assistance of one or more spirits. Japanese Myths and Tales by Flame Tree Studio reads, quote, The divine forces of nature, or kami, are thought to reside in rivers, rocks, mountains, and trees, meaning that almost any feature in the landscape may act as a cultic center. These may be marked by a small shrine for offering, or else just a tori, a specialized gateway remarking the boundary between the profane and the sacred. Of the Celts, archaeologist Miranda Aldhouse Green states, Central to this other world were the Shi, mounds in the landscape that were identified in myths as the dwelling places of the gods. What seems to have happened is that ancient Irish Neolithic passage graves, such as Newgrange and Noth, were claimed as Shi, even though they were built several millennia earlier than the medieval prose tales. This again is hinting at the idea that the power is in the land itself, which the gods seem to later make use of, and that they are not the source. The druids were famously known to conduct their rituals in the clearings within secluded groves, groves being small groupings of trees. The Gallo-Bretonic word for this is nematon, the meaning of which relates to both sanctuary and shrine and to a clearing within a grove. Superstitious natives believed that the ground often shook, wrote the Roman poet Lucan, that groans rose from the hidden caverns below, that yews were uprooted and miraculously replanted, and that sometimes serpents coiled about the oaks, which blazed with fire but did not burn. Nobody dared enter this grove except the priest, and even he kept out at midday, and between dawn and dusk, for fear that the gods might be abroad at such hours. Professor of History J. Donald Hughes writes, It was always the place itself that was the temple, originally the forest, not the structure erected to protect the image of the god. The mystique of the sacred grove was utilized by the Romans to portray the Germanic tribes as barbaric, serving as the eerie setting for their alleged grisly rites of human sacrifice. Yet, the general concept was anything but unknown to them. So strong was the Greco-Roman belief in sacred spaces or temenos that it was illegal to disturb them, and those seeking asylum within their precincts could not be arrested or killed. Although, Hughes elaborates, these spirits were perfectly capable of protecting their own territories. When the mythical Greek king Erisishtan cut down the tree of a dryad spirit, ignoring its protestations, he suddenly became plagued by an insatiable hunger. Oh, I'm hungry. We will remember too, of course, the misfortune that would befall anyone who would trespass on the domain of the fairies. Let's listen to a folktale which demonstrates the repercussions of such transgressions. This one is called The Fairy's Revenge, recorded by Irish poet Jane Wilde in 1888. The fairies have a great objection to the fairy wraths, where they meet at night, being built upon by mortal man. A farmer called Johnston, having plenty of money, 
bought some land and chose a beautiful green spot to build a house on, the very spot the fairies loved best. The neighbors warned him that it was a fairy wrath, but he laughed and never minded, for he was from the north and looked at such things as mere old wives' tales. So he built the house and made it beautiful to live in, and no people in the country were so well off as the Johnstons, so much so that the people said the farmer must have found a pot of gold in the fairy wrath. But the fairies were all the time plotting on how they could punish the farmer for taking away their dancing ground and for cutting down the hawthorn bush where they held their revels when the moon was full. And one day, when the cows were milking, a little old woman in a blue coat came to Mrs. Johnston and asked her for a porringer of milk. Go away, said the mistress of the house. You shall have no milk from me. I'll have no tramps coming about my place. And so she told the farm servants to chase her away. Get out! Sometime after, the best and finest of the cows sickened and gave no milk, and lost their horns and teeth, and finally died. Then one day, as Mrs. Johnston was sitting, spinning flax in the parlor, the same little woman in a blue cloak suddenly stood before her. Your maids are baking cakes in the kitchen, she said. Give me some off the griddle to carry away with me. Go out of this, cried the farmer's wife angrily. You are a wicked old wretch and have poisoned my best cow. And so this time she bade the farm servants to drive her off with sticks. Now the Johnstons had only one child, a beautiful bright boy as strong as a young colt and full of life and merriment. But soon after this, he began to grow queer and strange and was disturbed in his sleep. For he said that the fairies came round him at night and pinched him and beat him, and some sat on his chest and he could neither breathe nor move. And they told him that they would never leave him in peace unless he promised to give them a supper every night of a griddle cake and a porringer of milk. So to soothe the child, the mother had these things laid every night on a table beside his bed, and in the morning they were gone. But still the child pined away, and his eyes got a strange wild look as if he saw nothing near or around him, only something far, far away that troubled his spirit. And when they asked him what ailed him, he said the fairies carried him away to the hills every night where he danced and danced with them until morning, when finally they brought him back and laid him in his bed. At last, the farmer and his wife were at their wits' end from grief and despair, for the child was pining away before their eyes, and they could do nothing for him. One night, he cried out in great agony, Mother, mother, send for the priest to take away the fairies, for they are killing me. They are here on my chest, crushing me to death. And his eyes were wild with terror. Now, the farmer and his wife believed in no fairies and in no priest, but to soothe the child, they did as he asked and sent for a priest who prayed over him and sprinkled him with holy water. The poor little fellow seemed calmer as the priest prayed and said the fairies were leaving him and going away, and he sank into a quiet sleep. But when he woke in the morning, he told his parents that he had had a beautiful dream and was walking in a lovely garden with the angels, and he knew it was heaven, and that he would be there before night, for the angels told him they would come for him. Then they watched by the sick child all through the night, <coughs> for they saw the fever was still on him, but hoped a change would come before morning, for he now slept quite calmly with a smile on his lips. But just as the clock struck midnight, he awoke and sat up. And when his mother put her arms round him weeping, he whispered to her, <laughs> The angels are here, mother. And then he sank back and so died. Now after this calamity, the farmer never held up his head, 
He ceased to mind his farm, and the crops went to ruin, and the cattle died. And finally, before a year and a day were over, he was laid in his grave by the side of his little son. And the land passed into other hands, and as no one would live in the house, it was pulled down. No one either would plant on the wrath, so the grass grew again all over, green and beautiful. And the fairies danced there once more in the moonlight, as they used to in the old time, free and happy. And thus the evil spell was broken forevermore. But the people would have nothing to do with the childless mother. So she went away back to her own people, a broken-hearted, miserable woman, a warning to all those who would arouse the vengeance of the fairies by interfering with their ancient rights and possessions and privileges. The belief that disrespecting sacred space could invoke supernatural vengeance can be found as far back as Sumeria. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the protagonist slays Humbaba, the monstrous being elected by the god Bel as the guardian of the sacred grove, and proceeds to fell its trees to use in the construction of his palace. <laughs> This, of course, later incurs the wrath of the gods. Medicine Grizzly Bear Lake wrote, When such spaces are violated, the power reacts, first as a warning, then as a penalty. One contemporary example is in the case of Mount St. Helens. On the other hand, when sacred space is approached with respect and reciprocity, it provides an opportunity for people to receive supernatural aid. Shinto features over 300 classifications of kami, each of which has a different function and their respective spaces, and a person would choose one based on their individual needs. The kami inari, an entity associated with foxes, was known to be particularly gracious, especially in matters of fertility. Japanese Myths and Tales reads, quote, One legend informs us that a woman who had been married many years and had not been blessed with a child prayed at Inari's shrine. At the conclusion of her supplication, the stone foxes wagged their tails, and the snow began to fall. She interpreted these phenomena as favorable omens. When the woman reached her home, a beggar accosted her and begged for something to eat. The woman good-naturedly gave this unfortunate wayfarer some red bean rice, the only food she had in the house, and presented it to him in a dish. The next day, her husband discovered this dish lying in front of the shrine where she had prayed. The beggar was none other than Inari himself, and the woman's generosity was rewarded in due season by the birth of a child. We find similar practice in Native American traditions. A Cheyenne legend relates the quest of hunters who volunteered to explore a deep underground cave in search of food for their tribe. Though they were aware of the danger of descending into the steep, dark cavern, into which flowed a rushing stream, they were willing to sacrifice themselves for their people. A section of the tale recorded by writer Margot Edmond reads, quote, Because of the darkness, it took some time for their eyes to adjust. They then discovered what looked like a door. First Brave knocked but there was no response. He knocked again, louder. "'What do you want, my brave ones?' asked an old Indian grandmother as she opened her door. "'Grandmother, we are searching for a new food supply for our tribe,' First Brave replied. "'Our people never seem to have enough food to eat. Are you hungry now?' she asked. "'Oh yes, kind grandmother, we are very hungry,' all three braves answered." The old grandmother opened her door wide, inviting the young braves to enter. Look, 
out there. She pointed for them to look through her window. A beautiful wide prairie stretched before their eyes. Great herds of buffalo were grazing contentedly. The young hunters could hardly believe what they saw. This mysterious grandmother gave the hunters magic pans of buffalo meat that provided enough to feed them and their tribe. The next day, several herds of the animals miraculously appeared around the village. So through the conduit of the sacred cave, the hunters were given a chance to show their bravery and reverence, for which they were rewarded. The mythologies of the American Indians feature a plethora of supernatural beings associated with sacred spaces, what are often referred to in their cultures as power centers. Lake Tom stated, Some power centers are the residence of a special spirit who is high in status in the hierarchy. Others are the home of a particular family of spirits. Such entities have been placed on this earth from the very beginning of creation for a specific purpose and a reason. They have a specific job to perform for the great creator. As a result, these spirits either serve to create that source of power and energy, or they guard, perpetuate, maintain, and use that power center as the basis for their purpose and function. The spirits who reside within comprise that power center, adhere to and are governed by a system of natural laws. The laws are both spiritual and physical. These entities are both spiritual and physical. Their existence, the Earth's existence, and our existence are dependent on maintaining the natural laws in a harmonious state of balance. He goes on to explain that some power centers are actually considered to be too potent and holy for the average person to even approach, especially those in which the great creator himself was believed to reside. Most people are considered too impure to go there. If a person is committed to making a pilgrimage to such a site, They are expected to perform various purification rites and periods of fasting and abstinence, not only for their own protection, but also for the protection of the power center itself to avoid its contamination. Furthermore, this allows for a clear channel to the spirit world, as negative energies created through this impure behavior are believed to obstruct this. Amassing ethnographic data involving a long list of supernatural entities from the native tribes of California, the late anthropologist Thomas Buckley noted, In all the material reviewed, the creatures concerned are directly related to areas considered to be the loci of power acquisition, further explaining that monsters and liminal zones as anomalies constitute ruptures in the fabric of ordinary classification. Both allow heightened access to power and wealth by human beings ordinarily bound to a less highly charged theater of experience. These beings were often seen as guardians of the power centers with which they were associated. In his work, Realms of Healing, American parapsychologist Stanley Krippner describes an encounter with an ethereal being while visiting a sacred cave in Peru, near the ancient Incan city of Machu Picchu. After having been led by a local healer into the ceremonial chamber, quote, a most curious thing then happened. Up until this point, all of us had kept perfectly silent, examining the initiation chamber by the light of our small candles. Our guide then extinguished the candle, and the chamber became pitch black. As our eyes became adjusted to the dark, we noticed that there were small flashing lights on the domed ceiling above the stone altar. 
At this point, I felt an intense warmth in my belly, radiating into my chest, followed by a trembling in my arms. The ceiling above the altar, which previously had seemed to be eight or nine feet high, now appeared to be 30 or 40 feet high, and outlined on it were flickering dots, which looked like the entire evening sky. Standing on the altar, a form about eight or nine feet tall seemed to appear. It was a majestic figure, radiating light. In fact, its tall shape appeared to be made of streams of light. The figure appeared to be a man with a long white beard that fell over his crossed arms, which he held against his chest. This figure emanated a solemn majesty. Its face appeared like a radiant mass of light, sometimes resolving into the features of a man, yet most of the time remaining a glowing ball of light. A great sense of peace filled me. The being then appeared to speak and seemed to say, Welcome, my sons. Welcome to the land of your ancestry. We are the children of the sun. We are your ancestors. The time has come for the ancient initiations of the children of the sun to be renewed on earth. The energy of the planet is changing. We will be with you wherever you are. Finally, we arrive at perhaps the most fascinating aspect of sacred space, its function as a doorway between the planes of the cosmos. The possibility of travel between worlds by way of these locations is present in belief systems all over the world. Certain places were considered to be portals, whereby humans could travel to other realms and the beings of those realms could cross over into ours. Iliade asserted, where the breakthrough from plane to plane has been affected by a hierophany, there too an opening has been made, either upward, the divine world, or downward, the realm of the dead. Generally, mountains and hills were seen as entrances to the upper worlds, while caves and springs to the lower worlds. In several cases, it seems that gods or spirits had special control over these portals, more so than humans. The Celtic goddess Ipana was often depicted holding keys, quote, suggesting her power to open the entrance to the other world, wrote scholar Patricia Monahan. We see the same key symbolism with the Greek goddess Hecate. On the hill of Allen in Leinster, Ireland, there was reputed to be an invisible doorway to the other world, owned by the King Nuada of the Tuatha de Danann. In Celtic culture, the mounds were often associated with the other world. The Norse believed that the gods traveled across the nine worlds using Bifrist, the great rainbow bridge. However, it was also possible for humans to do this by climbing Yggdrasil itself. If humans gain the favor of the beings in control of these doorways, the possibility of using them became more propitious. In the Japanese folktale A Grateful Crane, the character Sentaro prays at a shrine at the top of Mount Fuji, where a paper crane appears to him and on its back he is carried to the land of perpetual youth. <gasps> in Celtic myths and folktales, there are many stories involving humans traveling to the other world. The Welsh hero Elidur, as a child, had been initiated by two of the good folk who took him to the other world, and throughout his life he was able to travel to and from the fairy kingdom through an entrance at the banks of a river. However, on one occasion, after stealing a golden ball from their realm, the entrance disappeared and he was never able to find it again.
Another famous example of a person crossing this sort of threshold can be found in the legend of Thomas the Rhymer. This is a particularly interesting tale because it's based on an actual historical figure, a Scottish laird named Thomas Learmont, who was famous for his prophetic and poetic abilities. In the story, Thomas encounters the Elf Queen, who spirits him away to her realm, where he stays with her for seven years. And off they went, and they rode through the woods. Now, just at that bit there, there's a, there's a slope going steeply down to what is now Kent as the Bogley Burn. And they rode down to there. Now, Thomas expected the horse to just lope over the burn. But it didn't he? It champed through the middle, and as it did, a splash went up to his een. And he had to dight his een. And as the horse went up the other side of the banking, well, Thomas had kept that whole air like the back of his hand, but he didn't recognise any of it. And it was somehow darker. It was almost as if they'd rode into the very burn itself. And he could hear way in the distance sounds of the sea. It was the queerest thing. Before finally returning to his world, she bestows him with a magical boon, the gift of prophecy. Aside from hills and rivers, we also have many examples of caves being used as portals. Among the Inca, it is said that the ceremonial caves, such as the one described earlier, were used by nobles and wise men at the end of their lives in a process of transfiguration. According to legend, they would enter the cave for their last days and seal themselves inside and food would be given to them through an opening in the antechamber. When the food was left untouched for a few days, the cave was opened, and the body was nowhere to be found. In Japan, from deep within the recesses of the Kayu Kukedo-san cave, legend has it that the ghosts of little children cross over from the land of the dead, Another passage from Japanese myths and tales reads, Softly whispering together as they stoop hither and thither, in order to build their towers of stone, and cover the sand with their ghostly footsteps. They depart before the rising of the sun. In the Irish folktale, The Enchanted Cave, an emissary of the fairy court, tells the protagonist of the wiles of his queen, quote, and seeing you, her heart went out to you, and wishing to bring you to her court, she sent one of her nymphs in the form of a deer to lure you on through the cave, which is the entrance to this land. The notorious Oenagat Cave is, according to archaeologist Daniel Curley, the birthplace of the Samhain festival. It was believed that the Morrigan, the Irish goddess of war and fate, would enter the human world through the cave to aid in battle and decide the fates of men. Post-Christianization, it became known as the gateway to hell and was believed to occasionally spawn abominable creatures of the other world, which ran amok in the Irish countryside. A 12th century account attests to this, which claims that on one occasion, a horde of three-headed beasts emerged and devoured everything in sight. The hero Cucullin also came to know the horror of the cave when he and his party were attacked by a group of three monstrous cats which gave the cave its namesake, meaning Cave of Cats. This connotes an interesting facet of sacred space, that not all is considered good or at least beneficial to humans. 
Lake Tom states that some places carrying negative energy are connected with evil spirits. We can expect to find these more often associated with subterranean caves leading to the underworld. Returning to the definition of the sacred given to us by Iliade as the ultimate reality, naturally both polarities must be represented. This is poignantly expressed in the Celtic Otherworld, which appears to contain the most heavenly graces as well as the most hellish nightmares, lacking the more distinct dichotomy between the upper and lower worlds we see in other belief systems. Portals found in the landscape are essential tools used by shamans in their spirit journeys. We saw this with respect to caves in the episode on shamanism. Among the polar Eskimo tribes of the Arctic coast, there is the belief in power caves, to which the aspiring shaman goes for initiation. These are hidden passages within seemingly solid rock, usually at the base of a cliff or hill that will only open for those who are destined to walk between the worlds. Anthropologist Alfred Krober writes, The novice goes alone at night to a place where the rock is hollow and resounds when trod upon. He walks straight towards this. If he is to become an Angakuk shaman, he will walk into a hole or cave in the hill. If not, he will strike the face of the cliff. When he has entered, the cavern closes upon him. When it reopens, he must go out, else he will be shut up forever. The late anthropologist Michael Harner, in describing the prototypical journeying techniques, wrote, A shaman typically has a special hole or entrance into the lower world. This entrance exists in ordinary reality as well as in non-ordinary reality. The entrance among the California Indian shamans, for example, frequently was a spring, especially a hot spring. Shamans were reputed to travel hundreds of miles underground, entering one hot spring and coming out another. Australian shamans of the Chipara tribe were similarly believed to dive into the ground and come out again where they liked, and those of Fraser Island were said to, quote, go into the earth and come out again at considerable distance. Similarly, a Kung Bushman shaman in the Kalahari Desert of southern Africa recounted, My friend, that's the way of this power. When people sing, I dance. I enter the earth. I go in at a place like a place where people drink water. I travel in a long way, very far. One of the themes that often comes up in these stories of people traveling to other worlds for the living to enter the realm of the dead is that this was essentially an unnatural affair. There were many risks involved and such expeditions often exacted a heavy toll. When Finn McCool returned from his journey to the other world, he was disfigured and prematurely aged. From the paintings of the wounded healer, to the myth of Odin sacrificing his eye and hanging himself on the world tree, it becomes clear that a price must be paid to cross the veil and bring the secrets of the causal world back into this one. To do so is a Promethean undertaking, yet the benefits seem to ultimately justify it. This process could be interpreted as a releasing of the material trappings in exchange for the divine, opting for reality over unreality, which naturally must be cast away to be attained. When Neo took the red pill, he sacrificed the comfort of living in his pod and had to suffer a rude awakening. 
Odin sacrificed an eye for wisdom, which allowed him to see into the true nature of things. In one story, he says, Then I was fertilized and grew wise. This, I think, speaks to the core essence of the way we interact with sacred space, to become a vessel which, like the earth, receives this inflow of energy. From the prostrations of worshippers in church, to the shaman initiate raptured into trance in the wilderness, the objective, at least in some sense, seems to be to become like the space itself. Despite our egos wanting to be able to forge our own destiny, in a tangible way, power comes from outside. Sacred space is a very important part of human life even today. Tourism authority Lester Borley states, perhaps the most powerful of all world tourism motives is the desire to visit special places which have a spiritual quality. Even in the most seemingly secular contexts, from the hiker who watches a sunset from a mountaintop, to the nostalgic visitor of their hometown, to the paranormal investigator roaming some haunted grounds, we all experience ineffable breaks in space. We might not attribute it to anything spiritual or supernatural, but we still experience it the same. We still feel instinctively when a place has good vibes or bad. When a room feels drab, we decorate or light a candle. And something profound happens in that seemingly simple act. Our relationship with space is just that, a relationship. And it's constantly shifting and evolving over time with both changes in the earth and in human civilization. Up until this point, we've been throwing around a lot of religious, arcane terminology. So you might be questioning the relevance here to our current world and our modern sensibilities. In the next episode, we will explore this from just such a perspective, diving into some of the contemporary research that's been done regarding the geomagnetic phenomena of Earth, from theories of Earth grids to paranormal hotspots, and more. You can choose whatever language you like. I think the essence of what we're talking about is the same. Remember the word sacred is synonymous with what's real. So perhaps science and spirituality aren't so very different after all. Both are trying to understand the nature of existence. So in this next episode, we'll see how some of these ancient religious ideas might help us to understand our modern paranormal mysteries and investigations in the realms of alternative science. And in bringing these all together, perhaps we'll get a little bit closer to the truth.